The Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. Before getting into the episode, I'd like to take a moment to welcome new show sponsor, CryptoCloaks. Welcome. You can find their amazing 3D printed merchandise at CryptoCloaks.com. Make sure you use the code ATPSHIP, that's ATP is in the energy molecule, S-H-I-P, P is in Peter, for 5% off at checkout. Thanks again, and enjoy the show. Okay, welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is Vijay Boyapati. He's a Bitcoiner and an author. Welcome, Vijay. Thanks, Alexandra. It's great to be with you. So before we get into Bitcoin and your book and various other things, let's talk about your background. Yeah, so I'm a former Google engineer. I'm a computer scientist by training. Uh, I came to the United States in 2000 uh, to do a PhD in computer science, but uh, I ultimately ended up taking a job at a small startup, which is a small startup at the time, uh, Google, uh, eventually became much bigger. I was at Google for about five and a half years. And uh, I, I spent a lot of my time working on Google News. My, my specific background was in machine learning, which is sort of a, a you know, subfield of artificial intelligence. Yeah, so I was there until about 2007. And I left to campaign in the 2008 presidential elections which was my, my big motivation for leaving. And uh, there was a candidate, Ron Paul, who came to Google and gave a talk. And I was just super excited about his message of non-interventionism, uh, you know, not getting involved in foreign wars, not you know, bombing other countries, uh, and his message of sound money and why we, why we need sound money and why it's important. Uh, those are just messages which no one was talking about and which weren't getting any airtime. And so I was really excited to quit my job and, and go and try and help spread that message and raise money for Ron Paul. Uh, so I managed to help raise a few million dollars and bring hundreds of volunteers to New Hampshire to help Ron win in the primary. Um, unfortunately, what I learned is that uh, these grassroots efforts don't have as much impact as these bigger forces at play. And, and one of them is the media. And at the time, uh, Fox News decided they were going to exclude Ron, Ron from the debate. And that had a much bigger impact than all the money I raised and, and you know, knocking on hundreds of or thousands of doors around the state. And so that made me pretty cynical about the political process. And, and I felt pretty dejected as well that I felt that there were all these powerful interests which really were against these ideas, which I thought were so important for human freedom and just, I think, generally beneficial to society. Then I came across uh, Bitcoin in 2011, and I, it took me a while to figure out what it was or you know, why it was important. But when I did wrap my head around it, I realized that this is incredibly important. This is a transformational technology once in, I think, once in a, a century type technology and that you can transform the world through technology. You don't need to go th necessarily through the political process. You can build technologies that will change the world. And of course, the Internet is an example of this. It has had a massive transformative effect on society. Uh, it's disrupted so many different in industries and I think has reshaped the political landscape as well. I think people having access to different ideas has allowed the world to be more free on average than it was before when information was being filtered through these channels that were approved like the media companies. So I, I think Bitcoin can have the same effect on finance and I think will have a profound effect on the world in general. Um, so I've just, since 2011, when I came across Bitcoin, I've just been so fascinated with why does it have any value? <laughs> How does this thing, which was created out of thin air by an, an anonymous creator, we don't know their true identity, how did it get any value at all? And not just any value, this year it, it reached a market capitalization of a trillion dollars. I think it's a stunning thing. And I think it calls, it demands an explanation. 
and as someone who's interested in economics, I think it's the most profound economic question of our generation. How did this new form of money come about? How could it be so valuable? And, and where is it going? All good questions. <laughs> and I think uh, I think a lot of the wider audience that listens to this podcast, maybe they're just learning a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, so I'd like to dig into that further as we go. Um, but before we do that, uh, so you talked a little bit about your Bitcoin origin story. I want to dig into what it was like working at Google in the earlier days. When I joined, it felt like a startup. It was just, a, I think, a couple hundred full-time employees and everyone fit in one building. So you could you could pretty much know everyone and Google always had this culture of providing free food to its employees. And this back then was, wasn't really done. It's, it's much more common in the tech uh, space now that companies will, you know, give free snacks or free sodas or whatever, but Google really went the whole way. It, it provided free high quality chef cooked lunches every day. And so everyone would sort of gather in the cafeteria and, uh, we'd get free food and we'd sit together and we'd talk shop. And it was awesome. It was so cool because we, a lot of the employees were just out of college. Uh, so we were young kids and we essentially lived our lives at Google. We would, we would eat there. We'd hang out with our friends were there. We'd go out after work together. We'd go out uh, to San Francisco. Google was in Mountain View, which is south of San Francisco. We'd go out you know, clubbing in San Francisco. It was such a cool environment. It was almost like an extension of college. And at the same time, it was like having a front row seat on history, on technology history, because it, it was a company which changed the world. You know, having the ability to have all of the world's information at your fingertips at all times is massively transformative to society. So being part of that was super exciting. And the company was growing like crazy. Like it was a couple hundred employees when I joined and five years later when I left it, I think it was 30,000 employees. So every uh, six months we ran out of space and we'd have people almost sitting on top of each other in these cubicles and we'd have to get a new building. And there's one story I remember we, uh, we moved from the original Googleplex and there was a building in another campus, the Silicon Graphics campus. And Silicon Graphics was a, a company that had gone out of business years earlier. And this building was gigantic. And I thought, oh, you know, I want to go to my desk. I went on Sunday before it, it opened for everyone on Monday and I wanted to see my desk and I wanted to just walk around. And th there wasn't anyone there, but I bumped into Larry Page, who was one of the founders of Google. And he, he kind of gave me a tour of the building and, you know, showed me, you know, where the different departments were going to sit. And it was so big. I'm like, how are we going to fill this space, Larry? And he took me to a window and he pointed out to the campus. It was not just that building. Silicon Graphics had several other buildings. And he said, no, no, we're going to fill all of these buildings. And it just, it blew my mind. Like, what? <laughs> how are we going to get that many employees? And then ultimately, Google not only filled that campus, it filled several campuses around the space. It's almost like a small city if you, you go down to Mountain View and you go to Google's campus. It was incredibly exciting. And, you know, Google, when I was there, had this motto, don't be evil. It had this uh, very high-minded uh, ethical standard. By the time I left, I felt like some of that had, had gone and it was much more of a corporate entity. And, and one of the things that really upset me uh, and, you know, it was one of the factors that made me less happy about working there was that Google was complicit in censorship of some of its products when it launched in China. And Google News was one of those products. And I was asked by my boss to, to write the code to help with the censorship. And I refused. I said, I'm not going to do this. Uh, and I actually got up in front of the company at, at one of the all hands meetings and said, you guys aren't aware of this, but we are censoring a product. And that was one of the things that upset me is that it hadn't widely been discussed in the company. And I think people were kind of shocked about that. And eventually Google pulled out of China because uh, one of the founders, Sergey Brin, had grown up in the Soviet Union. And I think he was much more sensitive to this kind of censorship and he decided it, it wasn't worth doing. But that, that was you know, kind of upsetting to me that I felt like Google had lost some of its ethos um, about not doing evil or being complicit in evil. 
And that was right around the time that uh, Ron Paul began campaigning. And so it all, all came together and gave me enough of a reason to decide to, to go and pursue another path. Yes, one of the interesting things, well, I guess one of the things about censorship is that it usually starts in darkness. So I really applaud you for, you know, standing up and speaking about it, because that's one of the best ways to combat censorship, because it starts as like, oh, we'll just censor here, or we'll, we'll just do this a little bit. And then all of a sudden, once you've established that framework, it's quite easy to scale that. So it's a slippery slope. And I think uh, one thing that worried me was that Google went, was thinking about going back into China a few years ago, and they were trying to justify why it was a good idea to, to censor search results. And I think they were doing it again, like you say, in the dark. And when it came out, there was a huge backlash. And uh, eventually they decided that they weren't going to do it because once it's brought out into the open and people understand what's happening, that's when you get political pushback or internal political pushback. And the same thing was true with you know, Edward Snowden revealing what the NSA was doing, having that information out in the public is the best way for the public to decide whether they're happy with that or whether they don't want it to happen. So, yeah, it's uh, it was interesting to get a small taste of that when I was at Google. So let's switch to your book, The Bullish Case for Bitcoin. So it was released as a medium article, kind of a long medium article, which is great because it really expanded, you know, all the different points and pieces about Bitcoin. That article has been translated into 20 languages. I wanted to talk a little bit about the process. So I understand you had a Kickstarter to create that as a book. Um, if you could walk our audience through that process, what you learned, some of the challenges, and some of your proudest moments. Yeah, so I, did, I honestly had no idea where to start. I decided in 2020 that I wanted to expand on my article and turn it into a book just because of the sort of unprecedented economic conditions that were created by central banks printing trillions of dollars. So I thought this is a good time to expand it and turn it into a book. So what I did was I asked a number of authors who had written Bitcoin books, what should I do? Should I go to a publisher and give them the content? And every single one of them uniformly said, no, don't use a publisher, don't go the traditional route, self-publish. And, and one of the biggest reasons given is that you maintain so much more control uh, when you self-publish. You keep the rights to the book. You can decide if you want to do translations. You can decide if you want to do a marketing event. You can decide if you want to give away some books. All of those decisions have to go through the publisher if you use a publisher and publishers are these old bureaucratic institutions that do not make decisions very quickly. So I, I specifically remember speaking with Safer Dean, who's written, you know, one of the great books, The Bitcoin Standard, and he said self-publish. And, and he intended to do that as well with his second book. So that was that was great advice. And and also just financially it makes a lot of sense as well because when you publish a book through a publisher, if you sell the book for twenty dollars, you can expect to get back a dollar or a dollar fifty, so a very small fraction of the cost of the book. Uh, if you self-publish and you distribute through, uh, say, Amazon or Barnes and Noble, you can expect to get five or six dollars, so significantly more. I decided to go another route, which is to distribute through Kickstarter to launch my book on Kickstarter, which is a website that people use for launching new products or services and getting funding to build those things. So you don't necessarily sell the thing immediately, but you say, if you give me a bunch of money, then I'm going to produce this thing and you'll be one of the first people to get it. So I decided to use Kickstarter. And the awesome thing about Kickstarter is when you sell directly to people, uh, if you're selling a $20 book, you probably get $16 or $17 out of the 20 So that's really a massive difference from the one, $1 you get if you use a publisher. I wanted to do a bunch of translations and I wanted to raise enough money for that. So that really gave me the ability to do that. And because I have an audience, uh, you know, I have a bunch of followers on Twitter, it was fairly easy for me to market my book and uh, have folks go directly to Kickstarter and, and buy that way. So I really, I recommend this to anyone who's thinking about writing a book, especially in the Bitcoin space. I think it's a great way to launch a book. And I, I think there's a lot of demand. People are very curious about Bitcoin. They're looking for explanations of why does it have value? A lot of people are looking for technical manuals, uh, technical books. So I think there is a lot of demand. And I think it's a great way for authors to get their ideas out there and, and just 
disintermediate the publishing establishment, which I, I, I honestly don't think provides that much value. When I look at the things that I did, I don't see the value that they would have provided, uh, the marketing and the typesetting, the customer service. I was able to do all of that stuff myself. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was cool because I control my own product and I get to decide which countries or which languages I want to to translate into and I get to make decisions about the artwork and the format of the book, all of that stuff I have complete control over. So it's, it's really a labor of love because it's my product entirely and no one else gets a, a say in when I get to sell it or who I get to sell it to. Uh, so highly recommend it as, as a way of writing a book and, and distributing a book. Awesome. That's something I might look into. I'm actually considering it's uh, something that started out as an article um, it's in Bitcoin, but it's far future Bitcoin. So it combines science fiction, hyper Bitcoinization, and it's about 300 years in the future. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I would buy it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I may hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's move on to, I guess we kind of touched on your Bitcoin origin story, but let's dive deep into that. When was it that Bitcoin really made sense to you? And you're like, okay, this is, this is it. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I came across Bitcoin in 2011 and I got my first Bitcoins in a bet with a friend of mine and it was a bet for a single silver coin, a uh, silver eagle, and it was about the Federal Reserve and their policy meeting. They had a, a policy meeting and the bet was over whether they would increase interest rates or not. And I, I won the bet and my friend said, hey, you know, I can give you the silver coin, but I think you should take this other thing instead. It's called Bitcoin. And it's this new form of money on the internet. It's really cool. I think it's going to be huge. And my friend was uh, one of the best investors I know, still is one of the best investors I know. So I said, okay, sure, I'll take it, whatever. You know, I don't need the silver coin. Uh, and he said, well, you know, you're going to need to download some software. I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and he said, well, yeah, you download this software and then you run it. And so I downloaded uh, Bitcoin Core. And I started running a node and it started downloading the blockchain and, you know, the fan on my computer started spinning and it looked like my, my laptop was under some distress <laughs> and it took hours and hours. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then eventually it had synced uh, the blockchain and he sent me uh, five Bitcoins, which was the, the value, the same value as the silver coin at the time, which was worth $50. And he showed me a very primitive block explorer and he said, look, I sent you the Bitcoins and it was just a string of numbers and letters like the addresses. And I'm like, I have no idea what any of this means, but it was fascinating. I was like, he sent me money somehow and hasn't used a bank or a, hasn't used PayPal, but somehow he sent me money. And so that began the process of sending me down the rabbit hole of like, what is this exploring what the technology was about, how the blockchain worked. Um, and then I really got fascinated with the economic question of like, how does this have value? Because this thing was created out of thin air. It has no, nothing, nothing's backing it. There's no government issuing it, yet it has a market price. And at that stage, it, it was already worth about $10. And so I, you know, as someone with a background in Austrian economics, I really wanted to understand that question. And I think it, it's a question that demands an answer. If you're an economist and someone's created something out of thin air and it has a market price and people are trading it back and forth, you have to ask, well, how did it get value? And so I've been just trying to figure that out for a decade. Uh, you know, I'm still still going down the rabbit hole. Um, in, in 2017, by that stage, I felt like I had enough of an economic understanding to provide an explanation to other people because there were so many misconceptions around Bitcoin and is it a Ponzi scheme? Is it the tulip mania? Uh, is it just a bubble and it's going to pop and it's going to go away? Uh, and I had been, you know, explaining to friends and family why I thought it was important. And I, I wanted to synthesize that into an article and I was hoping I could use it as like a, you know, quick link that I could send to friends and family to read. Mm -hmm. or, or if I got lucky, maybe a few people on Wall Street would read it and they would be like, oh, you know, this makes sense as a, a way to value Bitcoin. But it ultimately got read by far more people than I expected. It was better received than I would ever have dreamed that it would be. It, it's been read almost a million times. Like you mentioned earlier, volunteers, I didn't pay for any of this, volunteers from around the world translated it into 20 different languages. 
So it's very humbling to have so many people think that it's a good introduction to Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I guess that's uh, kind of the story of how the article came about. And then, you know, a, a couple of years later, I, I decided to do the book because I thought conditions in the market had changed dramatically. The Bitcoin ecosystem had matured a lot. Governments were doing some crazy things with their money printers. <laughs> so uh, I decided to expand the article pretty significantly. And I also wanted to cover some topics that I hadn't covered in the article that I thought were really important. The history leading up to Bitcoin, because before Satoshi Nakamoto published his white paper, there'd been at least a decade where cypherpunks were trying to invent digital money and essentially failing in these attempts. And by the time uh, 2008 rolled around, I think most of them had given up and thought that this is this probably isn't possible. So when Satoshi published his white paper to the cryptography mailing list, it was actually met with a lot of skepticism. You know, a lot of uh, seasoned cryptographers sort of said, no, nah, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> We've seen this before. And it's probably not going to work. And here are the reasons it's not going to work. I mean, there was, you know, one notable exception, the cryptographer Hal Finney, a brilliant cryptographer who unfortunately passed away from ALS in, in, I think it was 2014. He was one of the few people who said, there's something to this. Uh, I think you, this may be a breakthrough. And, and he was really uh, involved in the early development of Bitcoin. So I wanted to cover some of that history. That's one of the topics. And the other big topic I really wanted to cover is what is Bitcoin? I think there's been a lot of confusion about historically since Bitcoin was created. Is it a payment system? Uh, is it PayPal, a distributed version of PayPal, or is it digital gold? Um, and these two narratives are really competing with each other. And there was a vicious civil war in the Bitcoin ecosystem in 2017, just over what it was and what the future vision of Bitcoin should be. So that's another topic I really wanted to cover. It's really interesting how people try to define Bitcoin and say, you know, it's this or it's that. So you have some really interesting artwork in your book. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I found an artist on Twitter and uh, he's a pseudonymous. I don't know what his real name is. And he had some Bitcoin artwork. It's just hand sketches. And they were so cool. And I, I just messaged him. Actually, it wasn't even DM. I just uh, replied to one of his uh, pieces that he had posted on Twitter and said, this is so cool. Would you be interested in doing the artwork for a book I'm writing? And he wrote back and he said, sure. <laughs> and <laughs> and he did the art for my book and it's really great. And I think it makes the book much more interesting. And each piece of art sort of represents the ideas in the chapter. And amazingly, I still don't know his name. I don't know where he lives. Uh, and that's one of the great things I think about the Bitcoin community. It's sort of decentralized around the world. A lot of the people are anonymous, but there's so much cooperation and you know people want to help each other, whether it's in code or writing books or building a business. Uh, and this was an example where someone was willing to help me at no cost at all. I mean, he produced this art, which took him a long time, uh, which now adorns my book. And I'm so grateful I wish I could buy him a beer or buy him dinner or something, but I don't know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's one of the really interesting things as you get into Bitcoin is there's a lot of, so people think that Bitcoin is anonymous. It's not, it's pseudonymous. I mean, you can still always determine if you go into a block explorer, like who's done what. And if you see a particular address being reused, which is not best practice, but happens, um, you can kind of deduce who that might be or or other things. So it's it's certainly not uh, fully anonymous, but a lot of the people use NIMS in the space. And I think, you know, I think that's wise because, you know, people, people always say, well, if you have nothing to hide, why are you hiding? But with the whole cypherpunk culture, it's all about, you know, it's very strong with privacy principles and you want to reveal yourself, parts of yourself to different people and really holding on to what's important to you. And you don't necessarily know like which way the political landscape is going to swing or what's going to happen in terms of regulation. You know, or I don't believe that Bitcoin can ever be banned outright, but some countries are certainly trying. So, you know, do you want to be labeled a political prisoner based on the fact that you own Bitcoin? So I think it's wise for all the people that are in it anonymously. And uh, it's really interesting. Some of the best people I know in the space, I don't actually know them, um, but I know them through their actions and through their character. Yeah, I think that's a really great point in that people can be their most authentic self because there are all of these social pressures that exist and 
and outright laws and you know companies that are willing to censor or ban you uh, or deplatform you because you don't say the right thing and having uh, the veil of anonymity uh, allows you to be more authentic i think and and not have that fear that you know for instance that your reputation is going to be damaged because you didn't say the right thing and someone will interpret it in a really negative way and that certainly has happened a lot uh in the last few years where people are being attacked because of their points of view uh to the point where they can lose their jobs they can lose their platform for speech it is certainly a worrying trend in this day and age and i think that's one of the reasons that that's driving people to be anonymous or use a pseudonym uh when they communicate online so let's switch back to bitcoin where do you see bitcoin going in the next few years not necessarily in terms of price but what technical developments are exciting to you i think probably the big one is the lightning network because bitcoin at the base layer can't really handle that many transactions and that's fine because i think people have misunderstood what bitcoin is at the base layer it, it's a means of settlement it's a way of settling large value transfers and in the beginning people got confused and thought it was a payment system and they thought well bitcoin is for buying coffee uh mm-hmm. or you know making small purchases with very low fees actually it's probably not possible uh and it's fundamentally not possible because blockchains are inherently inefficient in that it's very costly to submit a transaction to the bitcoin network because you're distributing it across tens of thousands of computers around the internet and each one of them is recording that transaction for all of history they keep every transaction that's ever been done and that's quite costly to do that but the benefit of being decentralized in this way and paying this cost is that you get a system that can't be controlled and and it's very difficult to change which gives a credibility to bitcoin's monetary policy so okay you can't do small transactions it's not really meant to be done at the base layer how do you do these transactions well the lightning network is this great second layer development on top of bitcoin that allows people to instead of doing a, a broadcast transaction to the entire network and having it recorded by everyone you can open channels between people who transact a lot and then you can transact almost costlessly or very very low cost between that person over and over again so for instance if you made purchases with your uh, grocery store you could open a channel a payment channel with your grocery store so that you could transact back and forth So this is this is a great development that allows people to transact much more quickly and much lower cost. That's a big one. In in terms of adoption, I, the thing that I'm most excited about is uh the development in El Salvador. I think this is a profoundly important development. I didn't expect this to happen as quickly as it did where a nation state has allowed Bitcoin to be legal tender in their nation. And what that means is that people can use Bitcoin without friction. There's a huge friction of using Bitcoin transactionally in most western countries like the United States because if you buy a Bitcoin and then you want to go buy something with your Bitcoin if there's been a, a gain on your Bitcoin if you bought it say for $1000 and now it's worth 3000 when you go to buy something with that Bitcoin you have to pay tax on that and not only do you have to pay tax on that but you have to have the hassle of tracking the gain and keeping that in a spreadsheet somewhere so you can give to your accountant at the end of the year. So most people don't do that because it's such a headache and it's why do I want to pay taxes on my bitcoin gains? Most people want to keep their bitcoin gains well into the future because they think adoption's going to increase. But in El Salvador there is no tax. It's legal tender. It has it will have the same treatment as the US dollar. So there's far less friction and I think people are going to use bitcoin transactionally a lot more because of that which is is really exciting and and I think it's going to serve as, as an example for other countries in Latin America they will look to the example of El Salvador and say wow look at the people in El Salvador you know many of whom now have some savings in bitcoin which are increasing in value and that's a a great example for our people and also they're saving money from remittances people sending money back home who have left their country and gone to the United States want to send money back to their family they have traditionally used something like western union and lost 30 to 50% of the money they send back to their family to western union now they can use services like the lightning network and this business called strike which is built on top of the lightning network to send that money back at almost no cost 
and that's a huge benefit to them. So I think El Salvador is going to become an example, and I think a number of Latin American countries over the next, say, five years or so are going to follow that path and, and adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. So I'm super excited about that because I didn't think this would happen for quite a few years, and, and it's it's happening much faster than I expected. Yeah, I remember hearing the announcement at Bitcoin 2021, and uh, yeah, it was incredible because all of a sudden that opens up a whole new world of possibilities. And what was really interesting is, is right after that announcement, you could see, um, so in Bitcoin, there's a phenomenon uh, for people that don't know about it called laser ray till 100K. So there, there's like a meme factory. Anyway, I guess back in May, I think it was. That's a way to kind of signal that you're for Bitcoin. So within, I think it was the space of a few days, really, almost all of Latin America was signaling with laser eyes on their Twitter profiles, which was amazing. Oh, it's pretty cool. I mean, it was amazing to, to see that happen with all sorts of people. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, American football and seeing Tom Brady with laser eyes. Uh, it just, to me, started signaling. We're on the cusp of mainstream adoption uh, where this is being recognized as something useful and valuable to people across the entire spectrum. It's not just computer scientists and cryptographers anymore. It's football players, it's politicians, it's authors, it's like all sorts of people have gotten interested. A hundred percent. So um, being, uh, so let's see, while that's true, there, there's still a number of people that still don't quite understand Bitcoin or, or still don't get it. There's, you know, always a ton of FUD. Usually it's promoted by uh, some of the existing system that stands to lose if Bitcoin gains adoption. Um, so you have to be kind of skeptical of the, the sources of the FUD. So I guess for those people that are newer to Bitcoin, why Bitcoin? I guess one of the stories uh, that people use is like, well, Bitcoin's old technology or Bitcoin's, you know, boiling the oceans. And, you know, there's there's various FUD of the day. Uh, so if you're uncertainty and doubt uh, that make people kind of shy away from Bitcoin if they don't necessarily know what it is. So why Bitcoin for people that are brand new to it? Well, that's a big question, but uh, uh, I, I would start by saying Bitcoin is a new form of money. It's money that exists on the internet and money is a really difficult topic for most people to wrap their heads around because money is an economic good that's not really valued or doesn't behave in the same way as most other economic goods. So most economic goods are valued based on cash flow and people can understand them based on that. So real estate has rent. Stocks have dividends, bonds have interest. And so when people are trying to understand the question of like, why is this house worth a million dollars? They can say, well, it produces $70,000 in rent. So that kind of explains or justifies it. Money doesn't have any cash flow. So how does it have any value? How does it uh, have a price level at all? And this comes down to money serving some important functions in society. Store of value is one of them. Medium of exchange is another. We use it to facilitate exchange so that we don't operate in a barter society where you have fish and I have sheep and we're trying to figure out what the, the value <laughs> is. And unit of account, that's another one where people price things in terms of money and they calculate profit and loss in, in terms of money. Now, money is valued for these functions, but you have different kinds of money floating around. And the question is, how do human societies determine which money to use? And really it's based on the attributes that make for a good money. These attributes have been known for a long time. Aristotle wrote about them over two millennia ago. And they're things like portability. You want something that is easy to transport because it's really inconvenient. So cows were money uh, in some societies a long time ago. But gold is superior to cows because it's easier to carry around. And so gold eventually outcompeted cows. Divisibility. You, you want something that's easy to divide because you you want to use it in trade. And sometimes the trade you want to do is smaller or bigger. So you want to be able to divide it. Fungibility is one that people don't always think about. But you want one unit of your money to be equivalent to any other unit. So in this sense, gold is superior to diamonds because diamonds are irregular in shape and quality. And when you're doing a trade, you don't want to have to get out your magnifying glass and figure out like, what's the quality of this diamond? Is it a good one or a bad one? So gold is fungible, which is a great attribute to have. Probably the most important attribute of all is scarcity, because that's important for the, the store of value use case of money. You want to keep your savings in something that's hard to produce and which is generally scarce. So gold is superior to sand. 
if sand were money, then anyone could go to the beach and become rich and you wouldn't want to keep your savings in sand because your savings would be debased very quickly. Gold is very difficult to produce, which is why it's really good as a store of value and historically has been very good. Now, if you look at the attributes that make for a good money and you, you rank gold against fiat and Bitcoin against gold and fiat, you quickly see that Bitcoin excels along almost all of the attributes that make for a good money. It's certainly far better than gold on portability. I can transmit you know, millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars of value across the world to a person on the other side of the world as easily as sending an email. Sending gold in the same way is virtually impossible, right? It's incredibly risky. It's incredibly costly. The cost of insurance, it can be lost. So Bitcoin is far superior in that sense. Bitcoin is also superior to gold on the attribute of scarcity uh, because Bitcoin has ultimate scarcity. Only 21 million Bitcoins will ever be produced, whereas every year the supply of gold goes up by 2% and will continue to go up by 2%. So if you, if you consider these attributes, and this is something I go into a lot of detail in my book and in my article, you can see that Bitcoin is superior to the monetary systems and monetary goods it's competing with. And that's why it's winning demand at the margin from its competitors, because people are recognizing this. And as each person individually looks into this and thinks about it a little bit and figures it out, they say, well, that makes sense. I, I'm going to keep some of my savings in Bitcoin because... I don't want my money to be debased. I don't like inflation debasing my savings. And I also don't like the possibility my money will be confiscated. Perhaps that's not as big a worry in the Western countries like uh, the United States and Canada. But for people living in places like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, that's a big concern. So having a form of money that's easy to keep possession of that can't be debased, can't be confiscated, and is very easy to transmit over the internet is incredibly powerful. As more people recognize that, they decide they want to keep some savings in Bitcoin. And, and really, I think that's, you know, to put a ribbon on it, I think that's really the reason why, why Bitcoin uh, and why I, I think Bitcoin is important. Yeah, that's one of the things that you said a couple of things that I want to dig into real quick, and then a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap. You mentioned the difference between gold and money. And I think there are still some people that don't realize that gold no longer backs money and hasn't since 1971. Is that something we want to talk a little bit about and why fiat and all the money printing uh, that happened this past year, which, you know, has severely uh, devalued the currency, why Bitcoin is maybe a good hedge against some of that? Yeah, that's a great point. Gold had been money for most of developed human history since the dawn of civilization. Gold has generally been money in most places. Uh, and it was only in the 20th century that uh, nations sort of demonetized gold. And they did this in a few steps. The first step was that they created paper money, but it was backed by gold. So you'd have a $20 note and a $20 note in the United States used to mean one ounce of gold. You could go to your bank and say, I want to redeem this. I want to hold my physical gold. But then the first link to gold was broken in 1933 by Franklin Roosevelt uh, with Executive Order 6102 when he essentially confiscated everyone's gold. And he said, it is illegal to own gold. So hand in your gold to your local bank and we will give you dollars. Uh, we'll give you paper dollars instead. And that didn't completely delink the dollar from gold because nation states which held dollars were able to ask for their gold back. But it did mean that uh, Franklin Roosevelt could control the dollar value, yeah, the dollar value of gold much more easily. He devalued the dollar almost overnight by saying the amount of gold you can get for your dollar is now much less. So he devalued the dollar. So all of those people had to give up their gold, they got dollars back, and then he devalued the dollar. Now, what happened after that was that the United States crafted the Bretton Woods Agreement after World War II, which made the dollar the world's reserve currency. And then the, the US had this privilege, Charles de Gaulle called it the exorbitant privilege of the United States, that the United States could then uh, inflate their money supply and essentially export the inflation around the world. And by inflating their money supply, they could get goods cheaply in other countries. 
And Charles de Gaulle really took exception to this. And France said, well, these all these dollars we hold now because you're inflating the money supply, they're not worth as much. Give us our gold back. And this created a crisis, you know, finally delinked the, the dollar from gold in, in the early 70s because it was triggered by France saying, we, we don't believe you have enough gold because you're creating all these paper dollars. So we have all these paper dollars, give us the physical gold back. And, and they, they sent for their gold. And, and what happened was in 1971, I believe, Richard Nixon said, we don't have enough gold. We need to delink the dollar from gold. And so the monetary system we have in the United States is actually pretty embryonic or it's still pretty new. It's a system that's completely delinked from any backing to a commodity. And it's only existed for, let's say, 50 years. And generally, fiat currencies like this, which haven't been backed by anything, haven't lasted very long because governments have a tendency to, when it's easy or when it doesn't have any cost to inflate your money supply, governments tend to do that because it's a way of funding themselves surreptitiously without going out and taxing people directly and saying, well, we want to fund this, so we're going to tax you. They say, just let's print some more money. And this historically has always ended very poorly because people lose confidence in the monetary system and eventually they spiral out of control and the money money becomes worthless. So that's kind of some of the historical context of how we've gotten to where we are. Bitcoin is interesting in that it doesn't have some of the properties that gold had that made gold vulnerable to this kind of confiscation. Because of gold's physicality, there's a tendency to have your gold stored at an institution like a bank because it's costly and kind of scary to store your gold. You don't want to keep your gold under your mattress. And so this made it easier for the US government to go to these institutions and say, well, we're confiscating everyone's gold. Uh, and because it's all held here in the bank, we, we can keep it. Uh, we can take it very easily. But Bitcoin is much easier and uh, less costly to custody yourself. You can buy a USB drive and at very low cost, you can custody a very large amount, a large uh, value of Bitcoin. So if you wanted with one of these USB drives, you could hold you know, a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin if you're lucky enough to have that much Bitcoin at very low cost. Whereas uh, storing and securing a, a billion dollars worth of gold would take a lot of effort, a lot of security. So Bitcoin is, I think, it solves this problem that made gold vulnerable to a nation state attack. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, thank you for going into to detail as to the, the whole process about how that was kind of done through sleight of hand, moving, mm -hmm. you know, gold and dollars apart. Um, so I think once people yeah. grasp, grasp that, the conversation about why Bitcoin becomes a whole lot easier. That's a great point. I, I didn't mention that. A lot of people think that gold was outcompeted or something like uh, fiat currencies outcompeted gold and it disappeared because it just wasn't good money. It wasn't outcompeted. It was demonetized through force. It was governments forcibly confiscating gold that made gold not money anymore. So gold had been great as money for thousands of years and it was governments realizing that it was easier to get away with their policies of inflation that really created that delinking to gold. So we've talked a lot about Bitcoin, uh, a lot about economics, and we've kind of touched on hyper-Bitcoinization. So I want to get your thoughts on what the world looks like as it's going through hyper-Bitcoinization and post-hyper-Bitcoinization. What might that look like? The, the question for me is whether this process will be disorderly or not, and I'm hoping it won't be. Um, I think El Salvador provides a good example of a way that you could do it in a non-disorderly way. It's just to create a parallel monetary system and let it compete and let people slowly move over to it and, and have adoption work that way. I think in the Western countries, I think there's going to be a lot more pressure to prevent Bitcoin from being monetized so that the debt bubble that's been created can continue to grow. I mean, central banks around the world are just terrified of this idea that the debt bubble is going to burst. So they constantly try and reinflate every time the debt bubble looks like it's going to burst or correct and we get back to a kind of healthier economy. They try and re-trigger it by bringing interest rates down and getting people to spend more and borrow more. And I think that ends very badly because once it becomes big enough, it becomes very unstable and it's hard to unwind something that big without a complete collapse. 
And, and what I worry about is that a collapse in the debt bubble, even though that will be good for Bitcoin, because people will be looking for essentially a financial lifeboat somewhere to keep their savings that isn't going to be affected and can't be manipulated by central banks. Because at that point, when it bursts, I think the credibility of central banks will be completely destroyed. Uh, the, the 2008 financial crisis really hurt the credibility of central banks. And I think the next debt bubble when it bursts is going to be even bigger uh, and they're going to uh, have an even bigger hit to their credibility. So people will be looking for alternatives. But what I worry about is that, that there'll be social unrest associated with this and i think it's important not to blame the social unrest on something like bitcoin which is an alternative where people can keep their savings safe we need to really focus on where uh what what is the cause of this debt bubble and, and why is it exploding it's the central banks so that's that's the only concern i have i hope that nation states will uh, provide people the alternative voluntarily like El Salvador has, and that the transition can be smooth uh, and not chaotic. But I think it's an open question. It, it really is an open question what the transition will look like and whether it will be messy or, or whether it will be smooth. Yeah, that's definitely a concern. How we get there is, is going to be interesting. Um, and I, I really hope that, you know, like you say, El Salvador can serve as an example, because there's no reason that, I mean, other than benefiting the people that control the current money supply, there's no reason that Bitcoin shouldn't be a broadly used um, currency across the globe. I mean, it seems it seems like it's almost built for that. And you look at that throughout, throughout society as well. It's not just debasing the money. It's, you know, when you debase the money, then you can debase the value of, of actual human beings. Absolutely. And it, it gets to something else that I think is important is kind of moral decay in societies due to inflationism. Uh, one of the problems that people have is that when they earn money, they recognize that if they keep their savings in money, that those savings are going to be debased and they're going to lose their purchasing power over time. So people are forced into essentially gambling, like searching for yield on their money uh, so that they don't lose the value of what they've earned through their hard work. And what you see then is you get people gambling on things like GameStop, uh, the stock in the United States, which which kind of skyrocketed in price and, they, and then crashed because people are out there searching for ways to keep their savings safe. And the, the big disadvantage of that is that people no longer focus on their craft, on the thing that uh, makes them good at what they do, uh, the, their comparative advantage in society. So doctors, for instance, will, will be wasting time gambling or thinking about investment strategies or day trading when really they should be going to conferences or getting more training or improving their, their skill set. As a society, as a, as a whole, we all benefit when people focus on the thing that they're really good at and improve that rather than waste their time on, on gambling. But that's what happens in an in inflationist economic environment is that people are forced out there to do this uh, just to protect uh, what they've made through their hard work. Yeah, when we're all thinking about the money and focused on the money, um, it sure is easy to make um I guess make some decisions that maybe if they were presented all at once, you may not have made, but slowly um, you can easily kind of you know, go down that moral slope. Yeah. Money should be boring. Uh, <laughs> m money, money should be something that we don't think about. And, and we think, well, I can keep my savings in money and it'll probably be worth about the same, have the same purchasing power in a year or two years or 10 years from now. And people used to be able to do that with gold. They, you know, if they earned uh, a salary and they put their savings in gold, they would feel very confident that they could give that gold even to future generations and it would still have the same purchasing power. It would still buy as much, say, bread or steak uh, in generations hence as it would in, in, in the present. And we've lost that. We've lost that certainty. And that uncertainty creates all sorts of second order effects in society, many of which are very bad, I think. Agreed. I know it's 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 not happened yet, but uh, there is talk about hyper bit like post hyper Bitcoinization in the ideal world in its ideal state. What do you see that potentially looking like? One of the big differences is that when you have world on a fixed monetary supply, 
that really lowers people's time preference. It means that you can think more about the future because you don't have the uncertainty of the present of like, well, what's my money going to be worth in the future? And I think it leads to a lot more long-term planning. The other thing that I think, I, you know, is really exciting for me and a big benefit uh, of having uh, a Bitcoin standard is that governments won't be able to inflate anymore. And, and the primary policy reason for inflating historically has been to fund warfare. It, it's generally difficult to fund warfare through taxation because most populations, most citizenries uh, want to see a benefit when they're taxed. They want to know, am I getting some benefit? Am I getting some service? Are you providing something that's valuable to me and my family? And so there's a political limit to taxation. And, and typically, uh, most governments would face a revolution or you know internal collapse if they taxed people too much for foreign wars, because there's no benefit. You're literally destroying the internal capital of a nation to do something in another country, which also destroys their capital as well. So governments usually found it very hard to, to wage warfare on, uh, under a gold standard. Eventually, their population would say, no more, we're not doing this. And you know, various kings of England uh, found that they couldn't continue their wars in France uh, because the population would say, no more, we don't want any more taxes. This is too costly and we're getting no benefit for this. Uh, so I think being on a Bitcoin standard would be really exciting because governments would really be curtailed in their ability to wage these foreign wars, which have existed for, you know, most of human history. Uh, I think it would be great if they were going to do it, they would have to tax their citizens. And I think people would then push back and say, no, we don't want this anymore. That's fair. So to close out the show is to ask if you have any questions for our audience. Um, if so, how can they reach you and how can people find your book? Yeah, so I, I launched my book on Kickstarter, but it's now available for pre-order on Amazon. Um, you can find me on Twitter. That's a good place to contact me. Um, I'm real uh, underscore VJ at, at Twitter. So R-E-A-L underscore V-I-J-A-Y. Um, Good question. A good, good question for your audience. I guess I'd say, do you think about, you know, your savings being debased? You work hard at whatever profession you have. Uh, and, and what strategies do you have for thinking about keeping your savings safe? Uh, have you thought about the effect of inflation on your savings? Um, and does it concern you? Uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's usually a question I think gets people interested in thinking a bit, a bit about money. Awesome. Well, Vijay, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate your time and your insights. I think you've explained in, in a way that a lot of people um, hopefully can understand uh, why Bitcoin is important and, you know, some of the some of the trickery that's gone on with our, our dollar and, and value globally. So I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me.